should note this is uh, joint work. This particular uh, part that I'll be presenting today, work with Jared Carbone and Dick Morgenstern, um, but part of a bigger project that includes a number of other people at RFF, Dallas Bertraw, Hal Gordon, um, some other folks like that. So I want to acknowledge their contributions. And did I just... So just some background to begin. I don't think I need to say this uh, for most people in this crowd. Um, the U.S. budget deficit, and we'll be looking at the U.S. in today's work, um, the U.S. budget deficit is well beyond, uh, even if you look at the long-term projections, not just the current level, well beyond what people think is sustainable over the long run. And a lot of other countries are in a very similar situation. So excessively high budget deficits, well beyond what, what you can manage long-term. There's a second sustainability problem that everyone in this room is aware of, which is the carbon issue, that uh, emissions, you know, we need to do something about climate change. And a carbon tax has the potential to address both of these issues. So that's the, the motivation for what we're doing. So the project, and what I'll be presenting today is only one piece of this project, so I'll give you some flavor of what we're doing, uh, but, but there's way more than I could present in the time we have. What we're looking to do is look at the effects of a carbon tax in this kind of setting. So, and think about different ways of using the revenue from a carbon tax. So think about using it for tax swaps, for deficit reduction, sort of a range of different possibilities. And we want to look both at the efficiency implications and the distributional implications, and distribution across a number of dimensions. Today I'll just be talking about across generations, uh, but we, we're interested in distribution across geography, across incomes, uh, things like that as well. So the model that we've built that's sort of the centerpiece of this uh, is a, a new model that has three key features. So first, overlapping generations structure. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Second, multi-sector production. Most of the models that are overlapping generations have just a single production sector. Obviously, you can't model a carbon tax well in a model like that. And the third thing, a, a full representation of fiscal structure. Taxes, government spending, transfers, budget de deficits and surpluses, uh, sort of the, the key aspects that we want to be able to look at the tax piece of this. So overlapping generations gives us three key advantages for looking at this kind of problem. So first, uh, we don't have Ricardian equivalents. So in a lot of other models that have been used to look at um, carbon taxes uh, in a dynamic setting, uh, if the government runs a deficit, individuals save to compensate for that because they know they'll have to pay that money back someday, and the deficit doesn't actually affect the overall path of the economy at all. That's obviously highly unrealistic. For some questions, that's not, doesn't make much difference, but if you start looking at deficits, obviously it matters an enormous amount. Second key point, if you want to model the effects on capital, so either the effects of a carbon tax on capital or the effects of recycling revenue to cut capital taxes or prevent capital tax increases, you need to be modeling capital accurately. And in a lot of the other models that have been used, a lot of the other dynamic models, you effectively get an infinite elasticity of capital supply. It makes capital taxes look even more distortionary than they actually are. And then third, probably the most obvious point, that we can look at distribution across generations by having those different generations in the model. So we're looking at a series of different policies here. All of these are built around a carbon tax. So we'll be starting with a carbon tax. Um, that's going to start in 2015 in the model, uh, begin immediately, be permanent thereafter, uh, and what's not on the slide here but should be, uh, it's a $30 a ton carbon tax that is kept constant in real terms. That's just for simplicity. Um, realistically, you'd probably want one that's going up uh, you know, more than just the rate of inflation, but for simplicity, we're keeping it constant at that $30 a ton uh, in real terms. Um, so we'll introduce the carbon tax, and then for this first set of simulations, do an offsetting cut in some other tax in the model. So this is just a revenue neutral tax swap. We're keeping everything else constant in real terms uh, in the government budget. So the transfers, spending, revenue, deficits, all of that's staying constant in real terms. So what results do we get? Um, we get a, a, a small double dividend when we look at uh, using the revenue to cut capital taxes. Uh, we have positive costs um, for cutting labor taxes or consumption taxes. Uh, so that's sort of very much matching a lot of the other results from the, the literature on these revenue neutral tax swaps. 
Capital tax is the most distortionary, so cutting that gives us sort of a, an extra, gives us a small double dividend here. Um, cutting labor account or uh, value added taxes or consumption taxes, those are less distortionary taxes, so you get less of a kick out of cutting those. Um, so we sort of get, get a picture like this. So very much like what a lot of the previous literature has found. Here's where we start getting into things that this model can do that a lot of the previous work can't do, uh, which is looking at intergenerational effects. So what this graph has, going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, is going from the oldest people currently alive today to the middle of the graph where we're looking at people who are just entering the labor force today, over to the right-hand side where we have people who won't enter the labor force potentially for, for a long time to come. Um, so sort of going generations across. And then the vertical axis is the net present value of the average effect on that generation uh, of the different policies. We could spend easily my entire presentation time on this slide alone, uh, but let me just note a few things. Um, not surprisingly, cutting consumption taxes is very good for the elderly, does a lot less for other generations. Elderly in this model are basically sitting there and consuming. Um, they're not working very much anymore, so you get a, a big gain for them there. Um, on the other hand, cutting labor taxes works very well for the young, does less for, uh, for other generations. Um, and again, it's the young that are, that are working in this model. The elderly don't get much benefit out of that. One of the interesting things is a capital tax, even without doing any sort of deliberate redistribution, has one of the flattest distribution profiles across generations. So elderly people are getting some benefit because they're currently owners of capital. Young people get some benefit because of the boost in long-term growth that this gives as the capital stock increases. Uh, so we sort of get a, a relatively even spread across generations. Uh, which is pretty interesting and, and potentially fairly important in thinking about some of the, the intergenerational trade-offs involved with this policy. What vertical axis? Vertical axis, these are dollars per year in net present value. So we've sort of, per person. Per person. Very small. Yeah, yeah, well we're talking about a fairly small, I mean it's a $30 a ton tax, and we're recycling all the revenue. Um, so these, these are, are relatively small effects. I guess one other thing that I should note here is uh, this is just the cost side. So I've left out any potential environmental benefits of this policy, either for, for climate or for anything else. Um, so anything that's above zero on here is a double dividend for, at least for that particular age group. That's, those are the, those are the households that are just entering, so 95 is sort of the, the last ones that are in the, so those are the people who are 20 years old when the, the policy kicks in. So everyone before that is not surprised, those are the people, and that's why there's a kink there. It's sort of the people entering after versus entering already in the labor market when the policy takes effect. So moving on to the deficit reduction simulations, and these are uh, what's probably more interesting um, and going further beyond what's been done in literature here and, and what fits into the theme of this session. Um, so here what we're doing is using the revenue for deficit reduction. One of the tricky things in modeling deficit reduction is figuring out what the appropriate counterfactual is. That if we could just run a deficit forever and never pay it back, that would be wonderful. That you know it's sort of this extra source of income. Um, if I could just borrow money forever and never have to pay it back, that would be great. Um, but we don't think that's the way the world actually works. We've made a completely arbitrary assumption here that we're gonna do, in the absence of any policy to repay the deficit in the short term, we're gonna do nothing for 20 years. Um, that should say starting in 2035, not starting in 2035 years. Um, we can't put off the problem quite that far. Um, sorry about the typo on the slide. Uh, so 20 years from now, or 20 years from the start of the policy in 2035, uh, there's gonna be a one-time change to put us on a sustainable path. So it's completely arbitrary that we're doing it in 20 years, it's completely arbitrary that it's a one-time change instead of sort of a gradual shift. Uh, but basically what that's gonna do is we're gonna have a tax change in 2035 that'll put the, the economy on a path that in the long run gets to a 60% debt to GDP ratio, which is sort of the consensus about what's a stable long-term level of, of debt. Um, so what we're doing effectively, if we put in a carbon tax now in this, in this setting, uh, that carbon tax is paying down that deficit earlier. So putting in the carbon tax now means a smaller tax increase later. So this is still a carbon tax swap. We're still swapping a carbon tax for some other tax. It's just now we're talking about an intertemporal swap as well. So it's a carbon tax now, 
gets us a smaller tax increase later as opposed to a carbon tax now gets us a lower, t t you know, some other tax lower now. So what does this look like? First thing to notice is it really drops the costs, that we get a huge double dividend here in the, the capital tax case um, and get a very tiny double dividend for the labor tax, um, cutting, you know, preventing a consumption tax increase. That cost curve still shifts down significantly, but, but you know, not enough to get us the, uh, uh, the double dividend there. Uh, but key point here, there's a big benefit to doing something about the deficit now rather than putting off the problem. And that big benefit means that if a carbon tax is the way to do that, if the carbon tax enables us to do something now instead of pushing the problem off to the future, um, we get a potentially big gain out of that. And that can easily push the costs very, very low. Um, Next slide. So thank you for, uh, so as, as uh, Rick just pointed out, um, the, uh, exactly where we're going here. What's the problem with this is that we've just linked together two policies that benefit the future at the cost of present generations. So this is that intergenerational graph again when we're looking at this uh, carbon tax now to prevent other tax increases later. Key picture here look, you know, looks very different from what we had on the previous graph. This isn't flat. It's something that really is very skewed across generations and in a way that's kind of troubling. Everybody who gets to vote today would rather not do this policy. Everybody who benefits is too young to vote. So if we're actually, if everybody's voting their own self-interest, if nobody's being altruistic, nobody's thinking about those future generations, um, then this policy will never pass even though it's hugely efficient. Um, so this is just looking at the cost side. If we put in benefits, uh, if anything, we sort of don't, you know, doesn't make the picture any better. That adding in the benefits of, of preventing climate change, that's going to help those future generations. It doesn't do much for the people alive today. So we've just linked together two things that are both very important to do, very highly efficient, but also very much skewed in the same direction in terms of their distributional consequences, that they're sort of imposing costs today in order to prevent problems down the road. And if you link two of those things together, you haven't necessarily made the problem easier. In fact, you may have, may have made it substantially harder. So from an efficiency standpoint, using carbon tax to pay down the deficit looks great. From a distributional or a political standpoint, uh, the picture is a lot more pessimistic. So, and notice this is particularly true for the capital tax. So that's the one that is the most skewed over time. Um, so because you're getting those, um, essentially the, the sort of short run changes in capital returns really make a difference for the, the elderly. Um, the consumption tax starts changing things. People adjust to that a little bit earlier. Uh, and so that's a little bit more spread out. Uh, so, you know, so the one that was the most efficient is the most skewed across generations. Okay, so conclusions here. Um, the, uh, so first sort of obvious point, um, it matters enormously uh, for both the cost of the policy and the distribution of that cost, what you do with the revenue from the policy. So if we were to vary the carbon tax, I didn't put that in the graphs here, but if we were to do that, it actually makes, that carbon tax rate makes a lot less difference on these graphs than what you're doing with the revenue. So the changes in the, the sort of how you use the revenue for all these things tend to be, tend to be enormously important in driving the effects. Um, the most efficient option here, uh, in, you know, both for the short run, sort of cutting taxes immediately, and for the, the longer run deficit reduction kind of case, um, if we are either cutting capital taxes or preventing capital tax increases, that's the most efficient option. However, and this is stuff that isn't in this, but if we start cutting across uh, income groups, this is also the most regressive policy. So again, we've got, got a potential trade-off. It's sort of the most efficient thing is not as good on distributional grounds. Um, deficit reduction looks great in this model from an efficiency standpoint. So, you know, that was very clear from the graphs um, and is, is sort of worth emphasizing. Uh, you get a, a big gain from that. How big that gain is would vary based on what we do with that counterfactual, um, but no matter what, it's, it's really a substantial efficiency gain and can easily generate this kind of strong double dividend. However, there are big problems with that from a distributional standpoint, that uh, the intergenerational effects make it very difficult, again, to just to emphasize, 
you know, every current generation, every generation currently old enough to vote, winds up being worse off as a result of that policy, which could make it very difficult unless we have altruism, people caring about their kids or something like that. All right, thanks. Thank you.